All right, and with that, uh, Mike is going to start first, and he's going to introduce himself too. Good morning, everybody. Um, can you share? Can you see my screen number one first? Uh, I can. I don't see your slides. Uh, all right. How about there? I do not see it. Does anyone else? Uh, Niall said he can see your beautiful face. There we go. All right. Sorry about that. Um, so good morning. My name is Mike Raymond. I I feel like a bit of an imposter to this group. I actually teach in the White Ivory Tower, so, um, but I do have a background and I am an athletic trainer and I have taped a few ankles and I've uh, sat in on several middle school basketball games. So I do have uh, that background, but I am looking forward to sharing what I know. And, but also uh, I hope this is gonna be very, in discussion oriented in the sense of, you know, what everyone else is seeing. And uh, because mine is definitely gonna be slanted towards more of the literature and, but also some anecdote as well. So, um, so that's, that's me. Hey Mike, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, no. we're seeing your presenter view right now. Is there a way you oh. can change it to the yeah. main slideshow? Thank you. Is that better? That's perfect, thank you. All right, sorry. Um, this will be good practice because I'm starting to teach next week on Zoom, and so this is uh, not going well. All right, so just um, a couple things here is uh, I want to kind of talk about how, you know, I'm going to try to stick to the literature as much as possible, and but also just realize that, you know, there is a fair bit of anecdote related to this area, and the more I've, and actually what kind of started me on this whole thing in uh, FAI is in 2003 is I was working in an athletic training environment and I had a had a patient that um, was I was essentially trying to decide if they needed surgery or not and um, so I, as I went through my PhD and everything I felt like I kind of started knowing things and then the more I stay in this the more I feel like I'm going back through the Dunning-Kruger again so so probably going to potentially be more questions and answers but I do think that the fact that we have a lot of questions in this area is a lot more great opportunities uh, ahead for all of us. And I do think that maybe some of those questions and answers are different depending on what kind of environment we work in. For example, if you look at the literature is, you know, the literature would suggest and Andrea Center's work would suggest that if, uh, you know, athletes typically have either adductor longus and or hip flexor injuries versus the environment that I typically work in is, much more likely to see, you know, somebody that's going to go to surgery. And if you look at the surgical rates, the surgical rates are astronomically increasing. They're increasing more than any any other surgery we've ever done. You get to, you're seeing 2,500% uh, increase in rates over, you know, seven year period. And so then the question becomes, well, is it the next, you know, the next greatest thing besides sliced bread, or is it a train running out of, uh, out of control? And like most things, it's probably somewhere in between. And, but if, if you look at the post-surgical outcomes for these patients, uh, these patients are not doing as well as healthy controls. So it's probably not sliced bread. And so that kind of leads people like myself and Christian Thorberg to write these nasty little commentaries on, you know, the fact that surgery is out of control and, and going and we're just doing too much of it. But then as we age and as we self-reflect and as we get challenging patients, we realize, well, you know, some of this is our fault too, because we're not, we're not providing patients and or surgeons a, a good enough alternative. And, and our foundation for, for rehab is pretty shaky at the moment. So what is FAI? And essentially it's either, it's a mechanical abutment. Either the femoral head is too large and or the acetabulum overlaps it too much which potentially leads to 
labral tears, chondral problems, and this whole cascade of, of events that eventually is thought to lead to osteoarthritis. And so this is the, by far the most cited article from uh, Rhino Gans in 2003. And in 2003, he this is a cross-sectional study and he kind of looked at a whole bunch of hip arthroscopies and saw these larger than normal femoral heads. And he proposed, well, the fact that these heads are butting up against the acetabulum, that's what's leading these people to have osteoarthritis. If you really look at the literature though, this concept has been around since at least the early 1900s and, and Meyer described this kind of a concept in, in 1934 and so, uh, but this this article is pretty much what has led us to to think that FAI is a, a death curse to future osteoarthritis. And if you look at the Doha Agreement, the Doha Agreement pretty much puts it in the hip related groin pain. And so, versus you know the majority of you know, like Andrea Cerner's work and Christian Thorberg's work, which suggest that athletes are pretty much in this category, but you know, then they talk about time loss, and, and time loss is much greater for people with hip related pain than it is for, you know, adductor or Doha agreement type stuff. So, then in, in the same commentary, Christian and I propose this term FAI syndrome because these people are very heterogeneous and they don't have the same presentation. And quite honestly, I think we've all written or done things that we are probably not. I don't know if proud is not the right word, but like I kind of regret bringing this term up because I honestly, like I don't think this is the right term. I honestly don't know what the right term is, but um, the reason I kind of regret it to some degree is because it was adopted by the, by the, by the Warwick Agreement, which I'm, I'm also an author on as well. And, but the point is to, to truly diagnose these people is you need to look at their signs, you need to look at their symptoms, and their imaging all together because one of those alone is is not going to to help with that. And then I had the fortune of uh, just recently publishing another uh, agreement paper that talks about FAI as as a sub, as a subcomponent of intraarticular pain, along with chondral and uh, and potentially acetabular issues as well. So when you look at FAI syndrome, is you need to kind of really look at well how prevalent of a problem is this. And it's interesting is if you look at true epidemiological studies that have looked at people over years, it's really quite rare. And now granted, this is a, a Netherlands study, and there are definitely studies that show that the rates are different in the States than they are in the Netherlands or you know, in different countries. But in this study, it was less than 1% of the population which thinks, well, you know, why are we making such a big deal of this? And if you combine that with other studies by uh, Frank and other people that have done studies on people that are asymptomatic and showing, you know, that you know 50% over 50% of athletes have CAM, and 60 to 5 to 68 percent of uh, non-athletes and athletes have actually tears in their labrum in their hip. Why are we making such a big deal about this? And, and maybe this is way overblown, and maybe my 2015 you know, viewpoint was actually correct. Well, and then, then you then you get a patient like this, and this is not actually my patient. This was uh, posted on Twitter here recently, but I had this. You know, after I wrote that uh, viewpoint, I had this patient that came in that had this huge, very similar to this, had this huge carpet lesion, and was 24 year old athlete, and I was rehabbing him for a period of time, and even retrospectively. So, so essentially, this patient is doomed to have osteoarthritis and for a total hip probably by the time they're 40. And I saw this patient for probably two months. And looking back, and so it's like, you know, you know, looking back on it, I'm not really sure what I would have done different. Because if you, and then, so then you scour the literature and say, okay, what am I missing? And you talk to people like Richard Souza, who, who has done it, has dedicated his life's work to this kind of stuff. And, and, and this is really my question for this entire talk is, you know, what are, what are we, you know, what are you guys, what am I doing? How do we determine this is a patient that needs to go to surgery? Because if I, if I saw this patient from day one and knew what the result was, 
I would not have done any rehab and I was sent to surgery right away. The problem though is surgical rates. We don't know if these people are truly getting better as a result of surgery or not. But if you look at the literature, these, there are no correlations to limited range of motion. There are no correlations to limited pain. There are even no correlations to mechanical symptoms in these individuals. And so this, this makes us very challenging because 55% of athletes in, a, in some, as much as 55% of athletes in the study, and as much as 61% of, of ballet dancers in a study have grade one and two cartilage changes. Now those aren't carpet lesions like this, but you know, are those, are those a big thing or, or are they not? So, um, so the question that, I mean, my only question for this talk for everyone is, when do you refer this patient out? So then, well, part of it is, well, figuring out, you know, how do we diagnose these people? And so, and I know the end sent this, you know, this bottom article out and, and a lot of this work is based on some, some of these studies. And, and these are definitely studies I would suggest writing uh, not just because I wrote them, but uh, other people that helped me write them are, are smarter than me. So, and just remember, we want to look at signs. We want to look at symptoms and imaging all together. So, so what is the evidence for all these? What is the evidence for subjective symptoms? So we did a, a Delphi study and we asked experts, well, what are symptoms that you guys look for to see if somebody has, you know, intraarticular and or FAI syndrome? And these are the things that they listed. Pretty much deep-seated groin pain, you know, mechanical symptoms, stiffness. And then, well, then you look at, okay, so then what we did is we published a study that looked at, okay, all these people that went to surgery, what were their surgical indications? And so this is a Peter study that we published. And if you look at what they found is 38% of them had symptomatic hip pain. Only 14% of these people had mechanical symptoms. And if you look at the literature related to cartilage injury and acute traumatic labral injury, those people tend to have mechanical symptoms. And probably one take home I would take, take away from today is, uh, and as a result of going over this several times, is people that truly have mechanical symptoms that are consistent are probably very challenging to do well with rehab. And so that's one thing that I've probably learned over time. But the other thing is these people have all kinds of symptoms. Their, their symptoms are all over the place. They're very heterogeneous. And unfortunately, you know, the mechanical symptoms are only in, in less than 20% of people. And anecdotally, in my clinical experience, I would suggest very similar rates. So we truly don't know what the diagnostic, uh, diagnostic value is. The only thing that we probably know is if they don't have those signs and symptoms, if they don't have deep-seated groin pain, if they don't have mechanical symptoms, if they don't have those things, that potentially helps rule that out. But even then, is McCarthy and Bisconi suggest that actually may, that may not actually be sensitive. And so this becomes very frustrating. Because what happens is these people end up having pain for up to two years. And if you look at across multiple different studies, and this was one study that we published, and some studies suggest that, that these uh, symptoms are longer, the patients that I see are extremely frustrated. They go see the surgeons I work with, and they've had problems for two or three years. They've been to rehab multiple times. They come to see me and they don't want to go to rehab. I mean, they, they ask me, well, why am I coming to see you? Because I've tried this three times and it never worked. And so that's typically the patient that I see. And we've actually even tried to do tri you know, tr conservative trials where we had try to have patients come in and try to have them go through rehab and see if we can uh, and avoid surgery. And we had to drop this trial. We actually had a funded trial that tried to do this and we actually had to drop the trial because we couldn't recruit patients. So, and so what are the, what's their physical exam? And so this is what's been suggested in, by the experts, limited ranges of motion and uh, is pretty much the primary variable. But if you really look at it, it's, I mean, there, there are, when they go to surgery, there are a lot of people that have limited internal rotation and or hip the combined hip flexion and internal rotation. But even then, that's only about one third of the patients. 
And then you really need to look at, well, what is the diagnostic value and what is the clinical utility of that? And essentially it's very mixed. There's two different large systematic reviews and one says that uh, range of motion is limited in these individuals. And one says that it's actually not limited. And the other confounding variable here is there's new studies coming out that are actually suggesting that femoral torsion and or acetabular retroversion are actually probably bigger, bigger variables than limited range of motion. And so, but I mean, so how do you diagnose that? I mean, if you look at, you know, tests like Craig's test, they have poor correlations to MRI studies. And the other thing is, even if you diagnose it, what are you going to do about it? And so then if you look at, well, maybe it's sport dependent, you know, because if you look at this study out of Australia, it suggests that there actually probably is no correlation between a larger than normal femoral head and limited range of motion. But then if you look at high, sorry, if you look at hockey studies, they actually suggest that there are, there is actually a correlation between limited range of motion. But even hockey players, and I know uh, this will probably be discussed about later in rehab is hockey players in, in any sport, hockey players, a, a goalie is a way different athlete than, you know, than a linesman. And if, you know, if they do the butterfly technique, I mean, they're a different individual. So to, the take home point is range of motion is not an absolute correlation to intra-articular pathology, but it potentially is sport dependent. What about special tests? So the hip, the hip impingement test is the most commonly described one. That's what pretty much everybody uses. And if you look at the diagnostic value is, it's much better at screening than it is at ruling, at ruling in. So it's much better at excluding the potential for somebody to not have a condition. So it has what's determined as a moderate shift in ruling out ability and only really a very small ability to diagnose. So the take home is that if the patient is positive with this test, that is not really helpful. Actually, it did not improve your pre to post test probability at all. But part of the problem, and well, there's a lot of problems, but one of the primary problem is before you did the test, they had a, they had a probability of 90% of having that condition in the first place. And, and I can expand on that later if, if someone wants to. The take home here is a, the only time a fader's test is helpful in the environment that I work in is if that test is negative. How does it work in an athletic training environment? Well, there actually was a study, and I don't have it on here, but a study uh, out of Germany and Switzerland that showed that that pretty much is pretty much the same, that it's only a real a, a screening test. And even then, is the pre, the precision or the 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 precision of that uh, the, of that result is pretty limited. And then the bigger question is, that, you know, what exactly are we are we testing when we do something like Fader's test or Hawkins Kennedy test? And to me, it's remarkable how similar these these types of tests are. To me, it's remarkable how similar the things that we're doing in the hip are very similar to the shoulder, but yet we don't seem to be learning what the people in the, uh, working on the shoulder have, have already learned. Because if you look at it, the psoas runs right in front of the labrum. And there are actually people that are now starting to describe these three o'clock labral tears, which are thought to be as a result of the psoas rubbing up against the labrum. And so now surgeons are coming in, they're starting to do psoas releases, very similar to tenotomies in the biceps tendon and the shoulder. We're doing the same things that we did in the shoulder when we're having the same kinds of problems. And now we have all this other soft tissue and nerve related stuff there as well. So now the surgeon goes in and sees the back of the, so this is the posterior side of the psoas and has what's called a lipstick lesion, which essentially is a bruise and, and rubbing and inflammation to the posterior side of the labrum or to the side of the psoas, which is rubbing up against the labrum. So the surgeon says, well, I can fix that. And so what they do is they release that. And what we now know is the psoas actually, actually contributes at least 15 to 20% of restriction of the femoral head going anterior. The same thing that 
um, the bicep tendon does in, in the in the uh, shoulder. And the other thing is now we're starting to see tons of people that have synovitis. And a bunch of studies, especially ballet studies, are actually suggesting that relief of pain from intraarticular is probably more related to synovitis than it is due to anything else. So one thing, one test that I actually do like is the Thomas test, but not from a standpoint of looking at tightness, but more at looking at from a standpoint as I, as I lower their leg down, or am I creating mechanical symptoms, clicking, catching, you know, and, and, and is it consistent? And so as I lower their leg down, do they consistently pop, catch, and click? The problem again is that again, this is very few individuals and this is one study. So I tend to go from a more um, functional standpoint. And so this was a nice study by Femi Aini. And what they did is they simply had people squat as deep as they could and to see if they had symptoms. And, but not very many studies are actually utilizing it. And even if you look at people that have symptoms, so the good thing is the pretest probability is very low, but a positive and or negative test with squatting has a minimal ability to help diagnose somebody with FAI syndrome. And part of the problem is, well, is how do we diagnose FAI syndrome? It's essentially to a large degree based on how large somebody's femoral head is. In original studies said, well, it needs to be 50 degrees. And then we did a bunch of epidemiological studies and found out like 80% of the population has 50 degrees. So now we keep increasing this number. And so the CAM, the alpha angle, is this constantly moving target. And we have a study that's uh, going to be published here pretty soon that suggests it probably needs to be at least 60 degrees. But if you look at imaging, MRI is, is a very good reference standard. One thing that I really like uh, for when the surgeons use is intraarticular injection. The problem with intraarticular injection is it's not very diagnostically accurate. So even though I think this is the way to go, I, and but if you look at the studies, it's not overly impressive, which is pretty disappointing. And again, it maybe comes back to is, you know, what are we injecting? Are we injecting a synovitis that may calm down on its own if, if we calm the individual down? Or we do we truly have mechanical problems here? And so in summary, the diagnosis is pretty much based on a, a ruling out ability. In negative mechanical symptoms, negative deep-seated groin pain, negative fader's test, those all help rule out the potential for FAI syndrome. But again, those are in environments like I work in, not necessarily in the athletic training room. And then you look at, well, what are the outcomes? And if you look at the outcomes, and like I've alluded to before, is the rate of surgical, the surgical rates are exponentially increasing. And actually, studies are actually suggesting, well, these rates are going to continue to increase because more and more surgeons are doing these studies. And if you look at who's doing these surgeries, 600% of that growth is actually due uh, or is attributed to new surgeons, surgeons that have done less than 100 surgeries. And there are actually studies showing that complication rates are a little bit higher in, in those individuals, just like, like anybody that learns something new. And then while well, you look at, okay, well, how well are these individuals going back to sport? And this was a study we published that looked at all the surgical studies that were out there. And essentially we found that 74% of individuals go back to their sport. What we did not delineate was though, is are they going back to the same level of sport? And is their performance what it was prior to the surgery? Because that was not reported. But a Denmark study, actually a Danish study actually did look at this. And what they found is that when you, when you account for people going back to sport and performing at the same level, that only 57% of the athletes actually went back to the same level of sport and were performing at a similar level. When you dug deeper into that study is if you ask them if they were still satisfied with their performance, only two out of 10 were satisfied and performing at the same level. So then the question is, well, you know, do the Danish people just really suck at rehab or, you know, is that across the board? And, and I know all these individuals and, and some of these were my PhD supervisors and these are good, these are good people. And so it kind of makes you wonder is, 
is it 74% or is it you know 17% or is it somewhere in the middle? And it probably depends on the sport. You know, it probably depends on what the, you know, is it a compression mechanism? Is it a tensile load mechanism? Or is it somebody that's simply, you know, so I'm seeing a lot of CrossFitters now. And is it CrossFit or is it the fact that you know, somebody's doing 200 burpees now when they were doing zero last week kind of thing? So, um, and I think that's something that we don't truly account for. And is it something, you know, ballet is getting a lot of literature. And, and if you really look at ballet, I mean, if, if you would have asked me prior to some of these studies being published, I would suspect that these individuals are having all kinds of problems. But if you look at the literature, their problems are very similar to other sports. What we do know, though, is that these individuals probably have more cartilage problems than other sports. And again, so the kind of the point is surgical rates are increasing and we, it's very easy to bag on surgery. But if you really look at surgery compared to non-surgical rehab, and these are three different studies that looked at surgical rehab versus non-surgical rehab, three different randomized controlled trials that were published in very prestigious journals, Lancet, British Medical Journal, and American Journal of Sports Medicine. And all three of them suggest that surgery is a much better option for these individuals than is rehab. And so on the surface, this looks very poor for rehab. But when you truly dig into these studies, most of these people only had rehab for six to eight visits. And, these, and, and this was a thing that we published in when you really dig down is they probably weren't loading these people enough. And kind of the disappointing thing is there are, you know, PTs or physios on, on, on all of these studies. So, but then you say, okay, well, surely rehab is better. And unfortunately it's actually worse. And so, because there's only five studies published currently related to rehab and actually our best study is this study right here. And it's a level two study. And I would suggest, well, to, nothing against that study, but the way they did the rehab is absolutely not the way I would do my rehab. And if you look at the, the so what they did is they had people in a crossover design and people could, at, a, at some point in that rehab, could decide, well, okay, I'm gonna go to surgery. And I forget the exact number, but a huge number of patients actually pulled out of rehab and ended up going to surgery. So, we have a lot of work to do in rehab, in my opinion. And then there's this study that we just recently published. And then the question becomes on, okay, on rehab or on surgical studies, is it the surgery or is it the rehab? You know, so if surgery is not, if only 80% of people are truly doing better or doing as well as they did prior to surgery, because if you look across the board, 80% of people pretty much do the same or better than they did prior to surgery. So is that the fault of surgery or is that the fault of the post-surgical rehab? And this was a study that we've just, or is just actually being published today. And essentially is the post-surgical protocols are very inconsistent. And I think we all know this. And um, I mean, even where I work, we have two different protocols. And to some degree that's necessary, right? And so not everybody's individual, not everybody functions the same, but like even not everybody uses bracing consistently. Not everybody limits weight-bearing, even for microfractures. And not everybody does CPM. I mean, the point is we, we are not basing our post-surgical rehab on biological plausibility and or bio, biological studies. So the outcomes are pretty much uh, very, you know, so there's a lot of outcomes, but the consistency is, is relatively poor. And I mean, it's, is that a surgical problem or is it a post-surgical post rehab problem? I mean, the only thing that we can control is the post-surgical rehab. And, and my question that I always try to ask myself is, is I, am, am I addressing everything that needs to be addressed? Because if you look at some of the newer studies out there, patients that go to surgery, they're, they're mental, so they've measured. So Dan, Ron, and Chad Cook, and, Andrew, and there's like four or five of these studies that have measured comorbidities prior to surgery and then comorbidities after surgery. And surgery does not cause comorbidities, so I wanna say that. But what they found is the comorbidities, especially mental comorbidities, are actually increased after surgery. And so why that is, uh, I, I cannot exactly tell you, 
But I think that when we're doing our rehab, whether it's non-surgical and or post-surgical, is are we trying to address everything that that patient presents with? Because I think the last thing that we all want to come through our door is this patient, a 20-year-old patient with a carpet lesion that you were rehabbing for six to eight weeks and you thought you were doing the right thing and then they go to surgery and now they are cursed for having uh, a, you know, osteoarthritis and a total hip at probably 40 years of age. So that's my question is how do we figure out who this patient is? Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Mike, could you uh, make me host and then I'll start my lecture yeah. off. And I'm glad you kind of brought up a lot of that because as I was preparing for this talk and making my case studies, um, I started questioning myself on whether it was a proper diagnosis or not. All right. So let me screen share. Can you guys see my slides? Yeah. All right, thank you. Let me check if it's still recording, perfect. <clears throat> all right, so <clears throat> thanks Mike for going over all that. I figured I'd bring on an expert to talk about that rather than me trying to um, do my best at it. But I'm gonna go over some a few more articles on outcomes and how that affected my decision making into two cases I had. So the first one was uh, Griffin 2018 when they looked, they compared uh, arthroscopy versus best conservative care. This was a study done in NHS. And the biggest problem with this study is it did say surgery is better, but my question for it is, uh, is this an accurate presentation of patients we see? So in their study, the average age was about 33 and the average length of hip pain they had was uh, three years of pain. The other question I had in the study was, is there an accurate depiction of how we treat in the US? And about, um, uh, they had a lot of time <clears throat> between the diagnosis and the actual intervention given. So we don't know really what happened in that time. And then the PT given was uh, six to 10 sessions over 12 to 24 weeks, which I don't think is accurate of the way we treat in the US. Um, in addition to that, 72% didn't get six visits at all. And <clears throat> one minor thing that uh, kind of ticked me off was 47% did not complete those visits or with the reason being that they didn't feel their PT gave them progressions and exercises. Um, so this study itself, it was, I thought it was a good design, but it doesn't really reflect the way we treat in the US. On the other side, there was another study that was just published uh, this month. It was a five-year outcome study, and this is actually a follow-up study from, uh, they published a one-year outcome as well uh, for the labor repairs and elite athletes. And what you can see here is in the outcomes for quality of life and pain and symptoms, uh, for the most part, everything improved. <clears throat> but one thing they took also was the hip sports activity scale, which is their version of the Tegner specifically for the hip. And before the symptoms, there were level seven to eight is elite athletes. But you could see that even after a five year follow up, not nearly as many ended up in that group. And some things to understand about this is that. Um, they, they talked in the discussions that it might be because the people who did not, uh, they, that got the surgery, that did not do well or return to their normal level, that was just a, a consequence of their career. They were just at the end of the career, so they didn't have those years in them anyways. Um, but I still think that we should be mindful that for some reason they're getting better, but not returning to their elite levels. And then I think this is gonna be one of the biggest studies coming out soon. They're in the recruiting process, I believe, but there's gonna be a sham surgery comparison between um, groups that do and don't have actual surgery for the labral repair or labral tears. Um, so going into that, it, it left me with a lot of thoughts on whether surgery is good or not, um, or what's the best 
decision when we, we see these athletes in the clinic. So I thought I'd bring up two case studies. Uh, the first one's gonna be one I treated non-operatively. It's a division one basketball player, uh, a female. <clears throat> um, it started in September. She was on a curve and she said when her leg, her left leg swung back, she felt a sharp pain in her left hip. And originally the diagnosis was a sartorius strain. Um, so she kind of just tried to manage it on her own and then she was finally referred to uh, PT on November 2019. She had pain with sitting, cutting, sleeping, um, and she also described ra uh, radiating pain down her anterior leg. So she said it kind of zigzagged on her thigh uh, all the way a little past her knees too, and it worsens with more playing. She could actually get through practice and games for the most part. There's only a few times where she had to sit out, but um, she had high irritability, but I'd say she was very functional. Uh, there were radiographs and MRIs taken. Um, because there was no, the diagnosis was the sartorius strain, there was no MR arthrogram. And these are the findings. For the most part, things were pretty pristine in her tissues there as far as um, structure goes. She did get an injection. Uh, it was 40 milligrams of Kenalog, and she said that helped her for about three days, but it came back. And that was around um, October 2019. So um, a lot of the stuff I got for the exam is not only uh, Thorberg's paper in 2018, but the whole April 2018 JSPTR uh, journal is about hips in general. So if you guys want more resources, you can look into that. But I started off with a lumbar screen and the only thing that really hurt her was extension. But at that point, I didn't know it was referral or the fact that her hip was extended and causing irritation. Her gait was for the most part normal. Um, however, it was it was a little wonky, but it was also 8 a.m. and she came in with Crocs. She had never gotten physical therapy before, so uh, she wasn't the happiest to come in that early, and she was kind of just uh, sliding around. But if asked to walk normally, she could do it fine. Range of uh, motion-wise, flexion on her left side was 90, but was very painful. Um, abduction was painful in her lateral hip, but she also had full range of motion. <coughs> um, with... Uh, I did uh, external rotation, internal ro rotation, uh, and she had about, I think, 10 to 15 degrees of internal rotation stopped by pain. And then um, I did have a uh, mental muscle test for her too, and these values are below. For the most part, a lot of it was limited by pain. The I did external rotation and internal rotation and supine kind of in a almost 99 position, mainly because I didn't want to move her. Uh, she was very irritable the whole, whole exam. Because she was irritable, I kept my uh, special test to the bare minimum. Um, so I did fader, faber, and the femoral slump test. Uh, because she had some anterior thigh pain, this is a test I learned through John Snyder's course. Um, but essentially, you're gonna have someone sideline. Um, you're gonna have them slump in their upper back and neck. You're putting them into extension. And they're going to get positive. You feel it on the thigh or even anterior knee. And then if they uh, extend their head, it goes away. That'd be a positive. And um, turns out she was actually positive for that. We put her in that position. She was very irritable. And then when I told her to extend her neck, she said it uh, significantly reduced. So I think there was some nerve involvement there too. Uh, interestingly though, with her in high uh, irritability when taking the LEFS, she was only at 2% disability. And it does make sense because she was able to play through it. I think if I had her do the Hagos or hip specific uh, patient report outcome measure, I think it'd be a lot worse. And that's, that's something I would probably critique on my own. I'd probably take that one instead. Treatment wise, a lot of it was education and reassurance. This was her first injury ever. And me and her athletic trainer, uh, Scott Spernoga, we had to talk for about 20 minutes after the session to her because she was unsure of how it would affect the rest of her basketball career. So we reassured her that, you know, this is at the division one level, you're going to have some aches and pains. And based on her function, we, we feel like she's going to do well. We're probably going to go the non-operative route. Um, we told her a lot of success stories with this and that it's normal for in the division one setting for some people just to kind of visit the training room a little more often, but it's not something she's going to need to do for the rest of her life. Uh, and then when we did see her, I did some grade one, two hip mobilizations to help decrease pain. She was very irritable. So I'd say even my grade one was borderline Reiki, to be honest. Like I barely touched it and she was just so painful. 
Um, for soft tissue, massage, soft tissue massage, I did um, some on the TFL glutes and rec them. And again, she was so irritable. Um, my, the extent of my soft tissue massage was really very light pressure on, on those muscle structures and then just slight movement, kind of like a tack and stretch very lightly. And um, it did give her some relief, but then after a certain amount, it would just uh, make it unbearable for her. Exercise wise, we started with a lot of posterior chain exercises. Um, she couldn't handle much, so we started off with isometrics and then limited range of motion. Uh, really just gave her these as also a test too. We wanted to give her something tangible. So let's say she couldn't do a bridge all the way up because uh, it was painful. The next week, if she could go all the way up, even though she can only do one, that's something I told her is a positive thing that she could actually do the full range now, even if it was just one rep. So it gave her some, um, some hope there. And then I still gave her some hip flexor exercises. Uh, a lot of it was more of not heavy loaded at all. Uh, Mike had a really good presentation at CSM, I believe last year, um, where he gave up some of his exercises. I'd have her in plantigrade and have her kind of do a march in that position. So uh, gravity was taken off a little bit, but in order to, to keep things balanced as best as possible, because she was still sprinting and practicing everything, I try to keep uh, for every hip flexor exercise, I try to do three to four posterior chain exercises. And then I had uh, Niles assist me with the, her care too, and he dry needled her. The first day he tried, she was so irritable, she really couldn't tolerate it. But in the next uh, week, she came in again and she had some good relief with it too. I think the biggest thing here was, I, honestly, I don't think I was that much helped her. I think a lot of it because it was in season was really her strength coach, Jenna Reddy. Um, her coach before she even saw us really did a good job of selecting the right exercises, a lot of posterior chain glute work before warmups and then modifying her ranges uh, during her lifts. So even in season, um, this was about, I'd say a month after seeing me and minimal care, but Jenna even had her still heavy lifting without pain pretty good. Um, as for the way we do practices, uh, again, Jenna was the main one that kind of headed this part, but uh, we have polar monitoring and it does, polar really doesn't look at external load, it looks at internal load. So a lot of heart rate and then it gives us a player load but that's based on uh, how much time someone's heart rate is at a certain zone and uh, Jenna was able to monitor it that way there was really good buy-in with her coach too and then again Jenna did a really good job of doing exercise during warm-ups and I helped kind of give her some uh, progressions for the warm-ups to make sure she was wasn't doing the same thing over and over at warm-ups but actually getting a little better at them for games the way we managed it is I'd say if if anything I fully take credit for giving her a sitting pad if I was any use to her at all during this time. Um, that was probably the best thing that helped her out for a lot of her travel. Um, she was kind of like Linus and Charlie Brown. This is a picture of her coming off a plane and she's got her blanket, her teddy bear, and then that Airx pad that she carried pretty much everywhere. Uh, Jenna said it was pretty funny that she would like not leave without it and it really helped her out a ton. Um, for practices and games, we did a hip spica, which helped her a ton too. And uh, pretty much she couldn't play without it. So we allowed that. And then during games, some might not like this, but I was all about heat packs. Uh, basically every quarter we ran and got a new heat pack for her because it helped her uh, stay pretty warm and pain-free if she was to take a rest on the bench because she was playing pretty high minutes too. As far as postseason, once the season was open, uh, or over, uh, we did do rehab twice a week. At this time, she was already at home because COVID hit pretty hard over here. But um, so we did Intel rehab twice a week, and then she was doing some of Jenna's uh, home exercises sent at home, uh, sent her home through with the whole team. And then uh, pretty quickly, as I think it was just two weeks ago, we uh, moved down to rehab once a week over video, and then also gave her exercises. Uh, just last week, she started interval running as well. When I asked her kind of like a Sane's core question of how do you feel your hip is on a scale of zero to 100%, she said 85%, which we feel really good about. Um, I talked to her coach just yesterday about the progression for it, but basically, I'm really just going to check in with her and see her one more time next week over video. Um, Dan, I would give her your return to sprinting program, but Jenna's got a really good progression that she's going to do with the team too. So she's going to finish up her running program. But overall, this I feel this was a good case of um, a non-operative route, over, although it was over a few months. And I guess the question I have in this case when I, when I reviewed this to get ready for this talk was, was it truly 
uh, a labral issue um, or was it a nerve issue? Was it just irritation? What really happened there? Because some of, just like Mike had mentioned, some of the exam wasn't clear cut in this, but um, overall I'm just happy she got better and she was able to play high minutes and produce well too. The next uh, case I'm gonna talk about is someone in the operative route. So this was a high school uh, quarterback and pitcher. And as you can see with throwing, you could put a lot of torque on that hip. Um, so it was something we wanted to, to pretty much manage uh, carefully. Uh, for him, pain started in November 2019. Uh, this was around the near, near end of his football season. And then he was referred to me in December 2019. Um, it was worsening, but then two weeks before he was referred to me, he said he was squatting. He just felt a, a very sharp pop and pain in his left hip. And uh, it hurt him when he was sitting, squatting, sleeping, and walking. Um, so it was quite irritable then. Uh, so the main, the main reason with the main thought process with this was just timing. So again, this was December. And then in my head already, I'm thinking about timing. If he got surgery, it would take about four to six months. And then for football, it would start in um, heavy condition would start in June for him. So I want to be very mindful of that. And uh, we did have a talk about him missing his junior season of baseball, but potentially playing maybe summer ball, things look good. So with that thought in mind, this was his um, management of care. So again, he saw me two weeks after uh, re-injury. So that's week three on there. Um, I will say uh, right at that time, I told his primary care physician that he was having this problem just in case we wanted to move things a little bit faster. His primary care physician said, yeah, just send him over if you feel he's not getting better, but thank you for letting me know. Um, so we tried doing two weeks of rehab. This is about four times a week. Uh, once was in the clinic, once was in the training room, and then twice there's two basketball games a week where I'd go before the game and see if we can do anything there with him. And he literally didn't get better at all as far as his um, pain and symptoms and function. So at that time, uh, because the primary care already knew, he'd get him in immediately and check things out. His primary care physician said, let's still continue with PT, but let's put an appointment with our uh, surgeon on in um, three weeks from now. <clears throat> so we still rehab the total of five weeks, but he really didn't get any better there. So after they met with the surgeon, uh, everyone collectively decided to do the surgery there. And um, again, I think looking back at it, I'm happy that he got some rehab, but it obviously wasn't working. So I think he was an individual that would benefit from surgery, especially because there have been decent outcomes with surgery, especially um, now that we've moved essentially two months ahead and time is ticking for his senior season of, uh, of football. Um, so a week after that, he got surgery. Post-operatively, it was a lot of circumduction. Uh, SpongeBob here has a closed chain version, but uh, my mentor, Jeffrey Betts, who might be on the call, taught me some really good uh, progressions for it. But essentially, we started kind of doing a log roll and then having them bend their knees a little, moving it slightly, and then the classic circumduction where you put your, their, their uh, foot on your shoulder and you uh, slowly move it around. A lot of it, too, was contralimb uh, stretching, so having them do knee to chest, and then they'll feel a mild stretch there, and then lumbo pelvic training. And this was consistent with what our protocol said. Uh, for Gunderson's protocol specifically, uh, it was uh, partial weight bearing for two weeks and then weight bearing as tolerated at three weeks. Um, microfracture was different, but he did not have uh, any kind of microfracture surgery there. And then um, our surgeon, so we have two surgeons, one uses a brace and one does not. The, I'd say I treated six last year and all of them were from the surgeons that didn't use a brace. And honestly, they were all, they all did really well. Um, I'd say 80% of them were athletes and there was no issues through their whole plan of care without a brace. Uh, phase two, I put Mike Raymond stuff. Um, so again, I went to a CSM talk last year was pretty much, I dedicated CSM to learning more about FAI. And um, so Mike had some really good stuff about like active range of motion, being in quadruped, uh, doing some rock backs, changing your, uh, you're having your heels together to allow for more external rotation as you rock backs. And then again, kind of the plantar grade progressions of hip flexion strengthening. Um, in addition to, of course, the most important thing, which is the, the posterior chain and hip muscle strengthening. And again, that's consistent here. It's really just getting full range of motion back in our phase two of rehab. Um, and I felt 
I feel like this phase is actually probably the easiest part. Uh, they're generally out in less pain and the range of motion generally comes back pretty quickly. And then phase three is gonna be to be continued. That's gonna be for next week where we talk about late stage rehab and return to sport. Um, but in general, it looks like this. Uh, we allow at three months to start testing for running. We'll go over, I'll go over what I did for him, but we could start doing a lot more exercises um, that are more intense in that sense. So these are my references, go Deeks as usual. And then from here now we can start our discussion. And so the, let me check the chat real quick. Or let me move this over here. I think there's too many direct questions on there. Jim. It's just more commentary on doing what the athlete needs and uh, getting them ready to play. Okay. Um, can you guys all see my screen still? Yeah. I'm just going to yeah. unshare so we can see everyone's faces as we start discussing. Ryan, is there anything in the chat regarding questions going on? Uh, we just got one from uh, Dan. Just what dose of circumduction do you think is necessary, appropriate? With, uh, that's a good question. So sometimes I'll do it uh, for non-operative because sometimes it just gives them like a nice little pain relief. Same with the shoulder. I'll do just uh, kind of circumduction, really proximal to their joint. It makes them feel better. So um, I certainly use it in, uh, I certainly use it for non-operative too, just not as lengthy or as a big part of their plan of care uh, post-operatively. And then uh, any thoughts on circumduction exercises and conservative treat? Sorry, uh, I thought that was the original question. Uh, so yeah, I do it. Um, that, that's what I meant with conservatively. Um, circumduction dosing wise, to go back to Danny's question, um, dosage wise, I mean, Danny and I were over at Vail for a week and uh, patients there got therapy twice a week. And I mean, I, like half an hour to 45 minutes of it was circumduction. Um, I'd say I probably spent 10 minutes a session, but the main thing was we taught their uh, significant others to, or anyone, their parents or something to do the circumduction at the clinic. And we just told them to do it as much as they could at home. Um, and they were pretty good with directions there. We trusted them pretty well. Um, but to the second question about conservative treatment, Ada, um, I'll use it. I'll use it for the non-op patients, but it's not the biggest part of my plan of care. And yeah, the big thing uh, Mike had mentioned too, one of a, when I, we got to sit in for a surgery with Dr. Philippon and something he mentioned was sometimes a lot of patients or surgeons don't do, they don't stitch back the capsule. They kind of just let it heal on its own. It can cause a lot of the adhesions. So the circumduction can certainly help with uh, decreasing that, uh, any kind of scar tissue laying down there. Cause um, so one thing is check the surgical procedure, but also uh, circumduction is going to be helpful in decreasing any kind of adhesions that way. Um, but if there's not questions are right now, uh, my question is, uh, first of all, do you guys, does anyone have any issues, um, with common diagnostic tests that are being done? I think Mike did a really good job of showing those issues, but if anyone had any other, uh, thoughts on that, I was wondering what you guys all considered. Um, not so much for is an issue, but I'm more of a curiosity that, um, doing that, uh, Thomas test into extension. Do you think um, that there's overlap um, between like a snapping hip syndrome, which typically, you know, that tends to be diagnosed in younger adolescent patients, 12 to 16 years old. I see that. I've seen it historically in a lot of females versus like an FAI that we're diagnosing more into these skeletally mature individuals over, you know, 18 as they progress on into adulthood. Do you think that that might someday play out to be more of a continuum? Mike versus two different diagnoses with, especially with what you said with the psoas? Yeah, that's a great question, Ryan. And I think that complicates the presentation a little bit. But, <coughs> and so to me, so it's like, I will, it needs to match what they're telling me subjectively. So if, if they're, if they're like they're batting and they feel like their leg gives out every time <clears throat> and it feels like it's popping, <clears throat> I think it's important to, to discriminate um, snapping IT band versus 
versus mechanical. And so the, the more complicating thing is, is it intraarticular snapping hip, which is a psoas, um, or is it labral or chondral? And I think that is not always clear. And I think that becomes, so I think it's one of those where you have to keep teasing it out and then look at how they're functioning with different tasks and can you ch can you change it so like if i have them um, abduct and so, so sumo squat a little bit more and that seems to change it then i'm thinking maybe more it's like a snapping hip potential um but like even then i mean that's completely anecdotal so but i do think that is messy uh, this is pete from down in jacksonville and uh one of the things with the uh, thomas test that i've used it for is just to convince physicians that they don't need to release the psoas. So if they have a negative Thomas test, it's usually a tone issue. It's not uh, usually a true muscle length issue. And when they see that, it, it sort of puts it in perspective for them. Yeah, it's at a resting length. It should be raised off the table, whether it be at the quad or the hip flexor. The, the second thing uh, with that is uh, that, uh, Dr. Raymond talked about was the test of bringing their leg down into that position. The other thing is there's some people that still have instability. So if they're instability type patients, and there are some of them, if you take the leg down all the way to the table and then go into external rotation, you might stress the front part of that capsule a little bit more. And then uh, the last thing that, that I could share is that I worked with Philippon for about five years and Dr. Kelly in New York for about 10. So I saw a fair amount of hips. And the big thing is picking the right patient and convincing the physician that it's the right patient, that it's, it's almost like a collaboration. Uh, for instance, in golfers, the first 18 golfers I saw, nine of them had injuries on the lead leg, nine of them had injuries on the rear leg. That was with Dr. Philippon. When I look at Dr. Kelly, uh, when we saw football players, we had a series of about 45 or 50 football players. The two positions that were most specific were linemen and defensive backs. Uh, so if I had a linebacker going back to picking the right patient and seeing who might need surgery, if you don't have to get down in that position where you're putting a mechanical impingement situation where you can be impinging on the labrum, that person probably is going to be a good surgical candidate. A defensive back, on the other hand, might fit that Doha, Doha um, categorization because they may have pubic issues, they may have groin issues, they may have uh, overlying uh, hip impingement issues, and theirs is probably reactionary as opposed to true mechanical, like a lineman getting down. So I think that's the, that's the whole key with these, and uh, it was brought up about uh, the younger surgeons doing more of these. I got in a couple uh, arguments with some physicians because these young surgeons go away to uh, one of the uh, weekend courses for three days, and now they're coming back and doing hip scopes. If you talk to a Dashish Beatty or uh, Dr. Larson in, in Minnesota, it's probably at least 200 cases before there's a learning curve for these to take place. So uh, they're just some of the points that I, I've seen over the years. And one thing for Dr. Raymond, one thing I've never seen in the literature, and again, I'm not a researcher, but one thing I've never seen is where they do an exercise uh, study and they compare people that have normal version versus people that have retroversion versus people that have anaversion to see how the muscles fire in those three categories versus just not addressing that and seeing uh, uh, how the muscles fire in general from, from group to group. Um, I think, let me see if I had anything else that I was writing down. Uh, and uh, the history of it, too, is Dr. Gons, uh, the reason that impingement became important to him was because he was overcorrecting pelvic osteotomies. Uh, and that's how he saw impingement. And then with Dr. Philippon coming in and starting to do cases, what ended up happening there was um, that uh, he started to see the, the, the pincer uh, lesion and then also seeing the bump on the side of the femur. Uh, the last part is that I've seen, I've seen a lot of surgeons that have done these cases and not everybody uh, uses circumduction and they still could have, have decently good outcomes. Um, and it, it still goes back, I think, to um, a motor control, deciding on the patient, whether they're more prone to motor control issues. If you look at a book by Comerford, 
on kinetic control. One of the tests I actually use is I'll just bring the person and put them in sideline hip abduction and then raise their leg up in the abduction and have them do internal and external rotation and try and control that. If they have a pinch in the front of the hip, when you take the leg up with, ad, with internal rotation as well as uh, the flexion, and it goes away with an activation of those muscle uh, with that simple little exercise, it tells me that it's more motor control and I'm gonna try and dissuade them because they're less predictable of an outcome when it's people that are like that versus people that have the true mechanical impingement. Whether the alpha angle, uh, they'll argue, uh, I've seen people with 70 degree alpha angles that are linebackers and they play fine and they don't ever have surgery. But if you gotta get down in a position or you gotta sit a lot, those are the people that become complicated. Uh, and how much muscle tone do they have going into surgery? If they don't have much mu muscle tone going in, uh, they're usually a harder group of people to deal with as well. Um. Thanks, Pete. That's a lot of good stuff. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to rewatch this again too, because those are really good questions you asked. I would have never even thought about the um, firing position, but based on uh, retroversion and all that stuff. So that was a good point and all that too. Um, yeah, I think a couple, I mean, a couple of good points there and, and definitely um, don't remember all the points, but um, Thomas test, I think what you have to do when you do that is you, like I do contract, relax, and oftentimes what will happen is they'll drop down very quickly. And so I think you need to be careful about your interpretation on that. And I do agree with Pete on the hip. So there's actually a test called hip extension, external rotation, which is essentially what Pete was alluding to is you bring them into a hip extension from a Thomas test position, external rotation, and if they're apprehensive, it actually has really decent uh, diagnostic values. We published a study in JOSPT on that. And, and I think Pete, you asked a question about uh, version and or torsion. And to my knowledge, <clears throat> there are no studies that have compared muscle activation. I think the problem is diagnosing torsion and version. And so, for example, at Craig's test, you know, um, uh, people at USC have tried to compare it to, to MRI, and it's not very, the correlation is not very strong. Um, but there does seem to be people that have torsion in their femur. Um, they actually looked at, and those people tend to have a much bigger difference in IR versus ER. And, um, and then there's actually some studies that are out of Europe that are suggesting that it's, so, like people are trying to trying to diagnose her, GERD in the in the hip, and they're calling it HERD. Um, but I think probably what people are probably starting to find right now is it's probably the total arc of motion. Or I mean, so it, like this just fascinates me. Like I don't understand why we don't learn what we've already learned in the shoulder and and extrapolate some of it down. And so so there's there's some studies out of Europe that are suggesting it's maybe not limited IR, it's, it's the total arc of motion. So very similar to where we started with GERD you know, 15 years ago. But the, the point is that this, this area is so new that you know, like everybody's, everybody's trying to find something. And, and so there's a lot of anecdotal stuff and, uh, and that's okay to some point, so. For, for, for instance, one of the things that's pretty interesting, I, I, I was, I think, one of the first people had sent an athlete to Dr. Philip Horn in the late 90s. And what was, what was interesting is back then, before we even looked at impingement, they went in, they had a labral tear, and it was a golfer, actually, that every time he squatted down, his hip would get stuck and locked. And then I could take him after that happened because he couldn't rotate into his rear leg. It was always his rear leg. You take him back to the hotel. He'd do a little distraction, he'd stand up, he'd rotate fully. So we knew he had a mechanical problem. So back then what Dr. Philippon was doing is he was just taking in the, the torn part of the labrum, not the whole part, but just the torn part, shaving it off. They'd stripe the capsule, uh, to, just like an old capsule raffi, which may or may not have worked. And we had people playing four to six weeks later. And I... And then what happened is everybody thought, oh, this is the, this is the magic thing that's going to happen for people that we've missed all these groin and hip things. And then what happened is then the first 60 or 70 he did, 30 came back with still consistent pain, which led to, okay, there's something else going on here. And then that's where you saw the uh, FAI, FAI that was uh, actually uh, start looking for it. And then he starts shaving it down and repairing the 
labrum uh, and doing a labral repair. And then and now there's even people doing labral reconstructions where they're, I, I don't know, uh, the stuff that God puts in is probably a lot better than the stuff we try and put in ourselves. But uh, I mean, I know that there's surgeons that are taking off the whole labrum and using an autograph of some sort or allograph. And I just don't see that. I just don't see that. Cause if you look at Dr. Gon's work with the, the, the suction seal effect and what happens with that and the amount of compression that goes against the, um, the cartilage in the joint, uh, if, if you believe in all of that, it, it makes sense that the suction seal is important and is why a fair number of people get better. But what we saw in the evolution of this, I think, is that whether it be with Dr. Uh, Philippon or Dr. Kelly, is the better patient that you pick, the better the outcome was going to be. Sometimes you would go into those cases uh, into their clinic hours for post-ops, and they'd be painful in the early years. But now you go in and you have really good uh, patient follow-ups, uh, again, to the points that were made about the amount of weight bearing, the amount of uh, rotation. They used to put people on CPMs, uh, some people for uh, three to four hours a day. Uh, some people do that. Some people don't. Some people brace. And that's why, to Dr. Raymond's point, it's, it's so inconsistent. And I'm probably as, as guilty of it for not following it and categorizing it in the beginning because I've seen so many. Um, but again, it was hard in the beginning because it was, we were flying by the seat of our pants when I was doing it in the beginning. I know that. Yeah, I mean, some good points there, Pete. I mean, and just please everybody call me Mike. So, um, you know, I think, so if you do look at the literature is, I mean, it's like good surgeons, I mean, good surgeons are hugely different than, than you. I mean, it's just like anything, right? It's just like as a, as a clinician, but there are studies and actually um, out of New York City, they actually published a study showing that you need to probably do over 500 surgeries to dec significantly decrease your complication rates and, and post-operative uh, issues. And then even that same study in New York City, they showed that 88% of the surgeons that are doing hip arthroscopies have done less than 100 in, in New York City. And so it's the issue that, so the, the great surgeons, and Philippon has, has published this and shown that one third of his redos are from mistakes from the first time. And, and it's typically either overcorrection and or, or they've opened up the capsule and released the psoas. And so now you have this patient that is very lax. And, and like I always tell people is I, I, I can hopefully try to, I mean, it's very hard for a rehab to tighten somebody up that has this poor protoplasm, right? And so if they have really loose yeah. connective tissue, like what are you gonna do for that? And, and if, they're, if they're in a transverse plane and they're pivoting off that leg, they're gonna complain of catching, giving way. And then you're gonna think it's mechanical well, it's mechanical in the sense that it's shifting and it's unstable. So, like, yeah, it's like we've learned a lot, and and I and I've made tons of mistakes, and I mean, like I alluded to on that talk. So, so so again, too, like Dr. Philippon, the, the revisions that he and guys like Dr. Beatty and Bird and Kelly and those guys are doing is uh, in the younger uh, the people that aren't doing as many, they don't take enough bone when they do shave it down too. That's one of the common things that we saw as well. So again, to your point, uh, how do we correct when the, the mechanical problem wasn't taken care of? We're, we're probably not going to. They'll increase range of motion, but if they got to go into a bad spot, they're, gonna, they're still going to affect it. Hey, I, I've enjoyed this. I'm sorry, but I got to go. I got some people here now, but uh, thank you very much for allowing me to participate. Thank you, Pete. Thanks, Pete. Um, but yeah, R Ryan made a good point. It's something I've seen too about a lot of people want a hip guy at their practice now. Um, I think the folks at Oregon State, they'll drive their athletes an hour and a half way to Portland uh, just for their hip specialist there. So I think it's becoming something prominent. And even at Wake, we have a surgeon who specializes in the uh, only hips really here too. Um, the next question I had though was, uh, how long would you rehab an athlete before you refer them to the surgeon? I know there's a lot of considerations there, but what's, does anyone have any thoughts on that? Um, uh, maybe I'll start with uh, with uh, both my uh, both my cases. The reason uh, for the first one, we didn't refer her to a surgeon. Well, she saw a surgeon to uh, at first in September, but 
The reason we didn't consider surgery was because she was very high functioning on a patient reported measure. She was playing basketball fine, even though she was irritable. So we thought uh, we kind of used those as kind of prognostic factors and how well she would do with rehab. And then um, my second athlete that I technically referred for surgery, uh, a lot of it came to time. So looking back at it, uh, well, I'll go over it next time, but he was able to play a full football season, no issues. Um, but also he was not getting better functionally. Uh, his patient reported measure was terrible, um, even through three weeks or two weeks of rehab at first before he saw primary care. So that's someone I felt comfortable with saying uh, very, not even giving that much time, but saying, I think surgery might be a good, good deal for you. And obviously it could have been my, re my rehab too. I'm not, I'm not ignorant to that. I think, I think I felt a lot more confident about this prior to uh, Mike's talk here today. Look at that carpet lesion. Um, <laughs> Because I'm sure, I'm sure your your athlete was getting some somewhat better, somewhat stronger moving forward. And you wouldn't, and that that's kind of used to be how I how I used to do these was, as long as they were continuing to make functional gains and strength gains, and becoming less symptomatic, I would I would think that that person's going to benefit from conservative treatment. And um, thinking about like again, how do we miss a person who has that kind of carpet lesion in, in the uh, acetabula makes me nervous. Um, are, are we missing stuff that, you know, they're symptomatic for a reason and, and maybe we are making it more functional, but are we missing something? So I, again, I felt a lot more confident before, before Mike started talking today and now I'm going to have to go back and reevaluate everything I do with my life. I, I agree. Yeah. When Mike was talking, I was just like, man, I wish I had listened and then I'd save my part for next week. Um, and this is like, as everyone's discussing right now too, I'm definitely going to rewatch this again, just to take it all in again. I don't think I'd do that now. I mean, so the, so the, so the positives, um, if you look at the post-surgical, the post-surgical studies, only 14% of those people had true mechanical symptoms, which could be positive or negative. It depends on how you look at it. <coughs> you, I think one thing in retrospect that I, I mean, I, earlier I said, I wouldn't do anything different, but I think one thing I would do different is. Like when, the reason I sent them to the doc is because when we started getting higher level stuff, started having more mechanical problems. And so what I wonder is, did I scale them back too far to start, right? I mean, I didn't, so I think the natural tendency, like the, the young me would have just said, well, just stop doing everything. I didn't do that, but I may have scaled them back too far. And then the other question is, well, you know, that six weeks or whatever it was, was that really bad? And or and what we don't know is whether that person had surgery early or not. You know, does that make a difference? And then the other thing we don't even know is those people that have surgery for that probably still go. I mean, so it's my point is like, is there a way for me to figure that out sooner? But like, I'm not sure the consequences would have been hugely different one way or I mean, that's what I keep telling myself when I when I go to bed at night, so, but I, I don't know. I think, um, I think there's a lot to unpack with that. Like wh how long would you consider non-op treatment, right? Um, I think you have to look at like w what point they're at to your, you know, you said your athlete VN could play his entire um, football season. I think that's huge, you know, to consider like, you know, what, what's next season or what's training gonna look like you know, what, what their frustration is like this, you know, Dr. Or Mike brought up, um, you know, how, how these people go like at least two years or at least, you know, at minimum four months before kind of getting to these diagnosis points, what the surgeon's, you know, confidence level is and what they're looking at and what their outcome is going to be. If they're on the fence, you know, maybe more of a conservative approach. If they think it's a slam dunk, like we definitely need surgical correction for this. I think that's another thing that pushes them. And it, it, it is interesting though, because I've read that fashion study that you presented on VN. And I, I looked back at the numbers really quick on their outcome measure that I hot 33. Um, in to reach, they, they had such a strong conclusion in that surgery was better. But I think overall, what they tracked was um, at that six month follow up period, the non surgical group went from a 35 on the I hot to a 43. And then the um, surgical group went from a 40 to a 43 and sure you know they're they're in the middle of the surgery kind of 
rehabilitation. So you don't expect to see such a um, functional improvement at that, but their, their outcomes were uh, overall, you had a 35 to 45 in the IHOT for a mean uh, non-surgical and then the surgical went from a 40 to a 55. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think that there's enough there to definitively say which one's better. So I think in those terms, you have to just go back to the situation um, always and see what, you know, the tea leaves and every, you know, everything's presenting like. And, and I, can, I can send this article to, to the end, but you, you ought to look at Christian. Well, so that one article that we wrote, but then also uh, Christian Thorberg wrote a, a really nice article, a really short one. Um, kind of talking about the Palmer study, which to me actually has a few more issues even than the, than the fashion study. But I mean, of course, that's my bias. But so, and I can send that in. I mean, it's Christian Thorberg in the journal of, or the Physiotherapy Journal in Australia, but I can send that to the end. Yeah, and I'll send <clears throat> any um, articles that we bring up to everyone's email next Wednesday too. Um, but yeah, one thing I forgot to mention that five-year outcome study was that um, for the most part, their quality of life and symptoms after at five years was pretty much the same as their one-year outcome. So I think that's a good thing that it's not decreasing over time, but I'd like to see it go the other way and actually improve over time. Um, next question I had was, I mean, this one is kind of all out there. What interventions do, do you like for pain management? Um, I will throw whatever it takes for the athlete to be out of pain, especially in division one setting, um, especially right before a game in season. Um, that's why I chose heat, but what's other people do, whether it be manual therapy or an actual, like um, even ultrasound laser, have you guys seen success with anything in particular? All right, moving on. Um, How's everyone's phase one uh, critical? Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in there if nobody else will. No, I was right I guess I have, yeah, I mean, in our setting, reduction of pain, especially depending on the time of year, I think is important. Um, are we able to shut them down a little bit and calm it down? Or if they're in season like our athlete was, what can we do to help manage it in season to keep her as functional as possible? And I, again, I tend to stay away from stuff that has – zero evidence but the stuff that's 50 50 evidence or above i will probably steer into that um i think there is a lot of a lot to be said with uh decreasing pain to make someone more functional and um and as long as your intervention moves towards function i'm 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 good with that and i can get behind that now if, if you're if your intervention creates a crutch for them that they always feel like they have to need them need it that's a whole other talk for a different day but I, I do think as long as we can move people towards function and explain to them how it's helping them to move them towards function so they won't need that intervention overall I think that's that's the big thing um, so I'm actually post-op FAI on my left and something that was really effective during my rehab that my TT instituted was she was extremely aggressive with going after trigger points in my quads just hold and um, just really like almost um, something that I've learned here at Duke is just like, if you really go after a trigger point and you hold, you can almost get that twitch contraction to occur. And I, she, she was doing a lot of that. And then she did a lot of hip flexor releases on me. Just you're really going over that area where the psoas is. I know, you know, you're not palpating that, you know, but it really was extremely effective for my case. I look back on it now that I, I got that done after my first uh, trimester at PT school. Um, and knowing what I know now, maybe I was overusing my anterior chain to just be able to walk, um, you know, with the kind of brace I was using and it was just extremely effective for getting me out of pain. So definitely anecdotal, but worked for me. Yeah. We, we had a soccer player here who really been from that too. One of our athletic trainers had his really, a really good kind of like, um, hip treatment with soft tissue and deep pressure like that. And that helped her out a lot too. So uh, I, I don't think you're alone on that one. Um, Jeremy asked a good question, Jeremy O'Keefe. Um, what is the group using as objectives to assess progression and rehab to decide if the patient is progressing well? Um, for the case of the, the basketball girl I treated, 
<clears throat> so the first day she couldn't even tolerate a single or a straight leg raise without pain. And then we got her to do that. So that exercise was kind of the test retest. And then the next time she couldn't do a single leg bridge, we just kept it a uh, partial range of motion motion. And then sooner or later she could do that. So we're getting treatment in as well as a test retest. And then I kind of saw her get over the hump. I know she was playing basketball, but in therapy, when I just had her try to do a jab step, um, just that motion, the speed of it uh, hurt her quite a bit. So we slowed it down. Um, we had her pause a little more, pause a little more, lengthen the amortization phase. And then um, the next session, we'd have her do it fast and she could tolerate that. So, um, cause in her head, her function and pain is gonna stay the same. So she feels like she's not getting better. But I use those exercises as uh, something to help me decide if she's getting better or not. And also to give her a tangible thing to, to feel that, uh, oh, you're right, my movement's getting less painful and feeling better that way. Uh, that's just personally what I use. And I also use um, range of motion too. Um, so hip flexion supine. I, I'd say 50-50 people in, improve with that. Um, people who don't improve over time is the one I'm more likely to um, send to surgery after making decided motion with them. Uh, anyone else have any input on what they measure as far as a uh, test retest? Hey, VN, this is uh, Mike Zaro. I would say I don't always use range of motion as sort of an outcome measure or a way to stage progress. If somebody's got a true, you know, bony or anatomical block, the likelihood of their range of motion changing significantly probably isn't great. You know, maybe a few degrees here and there as it relates to overall guarding and kind of a protective, uh, you know, guarding of their range of motion. But I wouldn't expect someone to make, you know, 20, 30 degrees change in their hip flexion if they have a true cam lesion or something like that. Yeah, I, I agree, Mike. That's why I kind of said like 50-50. I kind of saw it. But I would say that people who did have a within session change in range of motion, I felt better about at least. But if they didn't, it's not something I, I put my hat on as far as I'm not getting better. Um, but that's a good point there. Uh, Daniel Karam asked, uh, referring to torsion, how much do you play around with their stance position with squat? And do you find that it helps? I'd say 100% uh, of my patients, that's the first thing I do. They say it hurts when I squat. Um, and I'll say, all right, let's change your position to more X and rotate, see if that helps or not. Um, does anyone have that or I'll go into the next question. Hey, hey VN, uh, on that, on that note, um, we can, uh, widen their base and turn their feet more into external rotation, uh, which will, and there's been a few studies that talk about constrained versus unconstrained squats mm -hmm. as an option. Um, other weight room modifications you can make for them or, or have them do a high bar squat versus a low bar squat. Uh, front squats are better or a better option than back squats. Um, when you're looking at deadlifts and stuff like the hip extensor moments better. Like, so if you're looking for hip muscle activation, deadlifts are great. Um, but you know, again, just with that trunk being more in flexion, it could irritate that front hip. So, you know, and when, when we're working with strength coaches and stuff, I mean, one of the things you could say is have them do deadlifts or cleans or, whatever from, from blocks um, or above knee lifts. I mean, to appease the strength coaches and stuff. And then the other thing I would add is that uh, 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 barbell hip thrusts have been shown in a few studies to have really great glute max activation. So again, that's another weight room modification you could use to allow people to um, still get some work in. And then the last one I would add is that uh, putting a band around the knees in, in a couple studies has shown increased glute max activation. So uh, by turning on that lateral hip a little bit more, uh, it may uh, provide a little bit less irritation. So for all that's worth. Thanks, Dan. That's a lot of good ideas. And I'd say half of those I hadn't even considered. So that's useful. Um, yeah, one thing I do is like instead of squatting and say we're doing non-operative, I'll tell them do a step up because it doesn't involve that. Uh, if they're doing it correctly, you cue them correctly, they're not going to lean over as forward, but they're still getting that um, strengthening and that knee range of motion they would like um, but there yeah there's a lot of good references uh, Daniel Karam asked if you could post that reference uh, Dan I'll probably get that from you after through an email um, Rick what reference specifically it's like there's a bunch of articles in that so I don't know which uh, what do you suggest you PubMeds what keywords What's that what keywords should we PubMed to look up the um, different uh, squats as far as trunk position and all that. I mean, I'm, I know that with like front squats, you're gonna have less 
uh, impingement there, but is there anything in particular that you like? You mentioned 131st when you talked about all that. I already forgot. You know what I think is going to be a lot easier is I'll just probably send you guys the presentation that I did on this. <laughs> That'd be useful. Thank you. I'll just, I'll just send that out later. Um, then let's see, Rick Droid said, going back to treatments, I've had a lot of luck with lateral distraction, adding some PROM while distracting. Uh, I agree, Rick. I think that's the, I think a lot of people start with that um, for pain management. It didn't work for my basketball athlete just because she was so irritable, but I definitely tried that first. Um, then Ryan Drima, to Dan's point on deadlifts, seen some success with pushing single leg deadlifts more than double leg in this population. Obviously had a limit to how much overload. Um, yeah. I've seen that too, Ryan. Um, I would think single leg was more painful um, on one of our athletes that was coming back from this, but actually she said it was uh, less. Because uh, um, I figured with the angle of it, if you're doing single leg, it's, the foot's gonna be more in the center, so it might cause some pinching, but she actually felt better. Um, I don't know why, but I said, keep doing that if it's not painful and you can still kind of work your posterior chain that way. But I agree with you. Um, I think my last question before we wrap up is phase one protocol issues. Um, has anyone else treated without a brace? Um, have you see, have you, what do you, how do you feel about having no brace versus brace? Cause I know that's a hot topic with knee surgeries and hip surgeries. All right. seems like no input. I'll, I'll contribute. So like, if you look at the literature, it's all over the place. And, but I, I know of several people, um, like some colleagues at USC, for example, that have like, completely gone away from it because they feel like it, the extra weight makes them use their hip flexor more. And so like my preference would be to not use a brace, but uh, one of the docs I work with uses a brace. And so, you know, and Dan brought up some good points too. And I think the point that we all need to be just a little bit cognizant of is those are making the assumptions that it's truly mechanically abutting. And I mean, we all have still have patients like you be in where it's like, they shouldn't be doing that, but they, you know, they feel okay with it. So um, yeah, I think it's definitely, you know, front squats are definitely better than low bar back squats, but you know, sometimes people have to do that activity. So the braces are all over the place. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Merritt asks, is there a significant difference between outcomes with labral surgeries with and without capsular repair? Um, what I, from what I've read, I'd say yes. Um, and I'll attach that article. That was an article from Philippon. Um, and then the last one we'll go over is, I was curious on the group's thoughts on regarding pelvic version, proximal stability, excessive engineer. Um, so it sounds like if we, question is, um, if we work on that, and I think uh, I think Stephanie Destasi talked during CSM last year about um, really just harping on posture, and that's why I had the sitting pad too. It would kind of um, cause less impingement when she sat. But I think posture is a, a big deal with it, um, and if you can do that, kind of go over that what getting in and out of it if they're irritable, it's going to be helpful for early rehab. Um, but I'd say that's useful there. Um, and then Aaron from Memorial Herman says there is no post-op bracing for the hip scopes. And that seems to do very well too. Um, but overall, we're gonna talk about this again. So if anyone does have questions and I'll take this log too, and I'll look through if we didn't answer anything and I'll put it on next week's discussion when we go over late stage rehab and return to sport. But it is an hour and a half now. And I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Um, so on that note, thank you everyone for coming um, next week. Mike is going to be there again, um, and then I'm going to pres uh, finish up my presentation on my post-op case, and then John Snyder is going to give us a good cluster of what tests he's for internal support too. So uh, thanks to everyone for joining this Friday again. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. That was awesome. Thank you for coming. Mike, it's always good to see you, buddy. <laughs>